that in a few minutes. But first of all, I want to read, please, from Acts chapter 25 and then straight into Acts chapter 27. We've got a bit of time tonight, and it's a while since we met together. So apart from an introductory verse from Acts 25, I'm going to uh, read the whole of Acts 27. It's, uh, it's laced with a story of the sea. It's a shipwreck, it's an account of a shipwreck. It's an account of what we call Paul's fourth missionary journey, although that was a one-way journey on this occasion to Rome and to his uh, eventual demise at Rome. And it's a very interesting um, portion that we have before us. But let's go straight into Acts chapter 25. Just to comment on this, if Paul was on the, the radar of the temple police in Jerusalem and the local police in Caesarea, he would be listed as a repeat offender. Because as you read the book of Acts, you realize that Paul spends a lot of time in custody. We see him in Acts chapter 16 in a jail in Philippi having been before the magistrates. And we see him here in Acts chapter 25, and I'm gonna read exactly what he says. Here we are, words recorded by Luke, verse 11 of Acts 20, 25, Paul speaking. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things which these men accuse me of, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. And this is the fulcrum tonight on which this whole account rests. Paul appeals to Caesar. And there is a response here in verse 12, Festus speaking. Festus says, then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you shall go. And so we now turn to Acts ch chapter 27 and verse number one. We're now in Caesarea. And I'm going to read the two verses at the end of 26, verse 31. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man, that is Paul, is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Verse 1. 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to the one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adrametium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonia of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When he had put to sea, when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, the city of Lycia. Then the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly for many days and arrived with difficulty at Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete to Salomon, to Salomon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, 
near to the city of Lycia. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, men I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only to the cargo and ship, but also to our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken of by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means we could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and the northwest and winter there. It was going to be a long haul. When the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship and fearing lest they should run aground on the citrus sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because there was exceedingly, we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and this loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You, have, you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near to some land and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food saying, today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Verse 34, therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. 
And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, they began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat, that is the cargo, into the sea. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left the, and they let go the anchors and left them in the sea, meanwhile loosing the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for the shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow, that is the bow, stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped the safety of the land. And finally, to set it, to set it context, chapter 28 and verse 1. Now, when they had escaped, they found out that it was the island called Malta, a long way from Caesarea. Right, that's my first reading. The second reading I have for you is to set things in context. I've got two readings here from the, the published notes in another version of the New King James Version. And this is called, or headed, Paul's Roman Citizenship. And this is good, interesting background stuff because again, it, um, it sets in context exactly why Paul has appealed to Caesar. I'm not gonna read all of it, but I'm gonna start halfway through here. Later in Jerusalem, Paul was taken into protective custody by Roman soldiers as a group of Jewish zealots threatened his life. This is stuff that we've covered already. He was spared a scourging by the soldiers and granted a hearing before the commander when he revealed his Roman citizenship. The soldiers also gave him safe passage out of Jerusalem when the Jewish zealots persisted in their threat against Paul. Imprisoned by Roman officials at Caesarea for two years, Paul finally appealed to Rome, which brings us right up to date in chapter 27. He was sent out in a merchant ship to Rome. In fact, we'll find as we read carefully tonight that it was two merchant ships involved, not just the one. And he spent two years under house arrest at Rome. Here he was to be allowed to preach and make converts. So that's Paul's Roman citizenship. And I want to read another commentary here. And this is a commentary about the place where Paul was prisoner for two years immediately before his departure for Rome. And this is an account of Caesarea. And I'm not sure how much we know about um, Sitters in the in the period of the um, early church, we imagine them to be small places, unsophistic unsophisticated places. But listen to this account of the city of Caesarea, which is on the coast, and from which Paul departed by ship with Julius the centurion. Caesarea, a city in central Palestine on the Mediterranean Sea 
served as the commercial port for the Roman dominated Jewish territories during the New Testament period. Built by the master Roman builder Herod the Great between 25 and 13 BC. The city was known throughout the Roman world for its beauty as well as its spacious, well protected harbor. In addition to its commercial importance, Caesarea also served as Rome's administrative capital for the Jewish territories during the New Testament era. This is why Caesarea is mentioned so prominently in connection with the ministry of the Apostle Paul and other New Testament personalities. Philip preached at Caesarea and Peter was sent to this administrative capital to minister to Cornelius, the Roman centurion, Acts chapter 10. Paul made Caesarea his port of call after his second and third missionary journeys. A Roman official sent Paul to the Roman governor Felix for trial after he was charged with disturbing the peace in Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul spent two years in prison at Caesarea before making his celebrated defense before Festus and Agrippa, Acts chapter 25. After his long Caesarean imprisonment, he finally sailed from the harbor in chains to appeal his case before the emperor in Rome. And finally, Herod's seaport city was built on the site of the ancient Phoenician seaport city known as Stratus Tower. Right, I'm, I'm sure that uh, that last bit of information will be in everybody's notebook tonight. So that's an account of Paul's Roman citizenship and also this place called Caesarea where Paul is imprisoned. So we've dealt tonight, first of all, by chapter, reading the whole of chapter 27. And I make no apology, it is quite a long chapter, but it sets in context the whole of this issue before us, this journey towards Rome. It's important to notice, please, the dominance of trade and Roman influence in this time that Paul is operating here at about AD 60. I went back to the Times um, history of the world and just read up an account of the dominance of Rome in this particular era. You will find, those of you who know probably more about Roman history than I do, that the whole of the Mediterranean region at this time in history was totally dominated by Roman influence of one form or another. Some it was also almost by um, recognition of their administrative ability, and sometimes it was simply soldierly warfaring dominance that placed them in such a high position. And they had really taken over where the Greeks left off. And the other very interesting thing to note is that there were there was a massive trade by sea across the whole of the Mediterranean region. And it's been estimated that the actual connectivity that existed in that first century AD was not surpassed until the 19th century. So almost 2000 years elapsed before you had the same degree of connectivity that you had in that first century AD. And this brings me tonight now to um, some comments from my own background. Let's just deal with crossing the Mediterranean. In this era when Paul was a prisoner and was taken off to appeal before Caesar, the only power that was available to him was either to travel by land, which was an arduous journey, or to go by sea. And it was wind power alone. So this brings me to a bit of background history. 
I'm going to show you a picture here, a painting that was done by a bosun that I knew in the early 19, mid 1960s. And this ship here is called the British Signal. And I spent nearly two years of my life on ships of this size. This was a super tanker of its time. It was Italian built. They were called the light ships by BP. This was the British Signal. And I also served on the British Comment. Comet. Comet, that is, as light in the sky. And I've estimated that I covered about 50,000 nautical miles in these two ships. I was 18, I think, when I joined this ship, and I was 19 when I left. My first voyage was on a, a, a tanker about half of this size. And on that tanker, I spent my first voyages as a, a new recruit, 16 years old going on 17, and in that first ship, I covered some 90,000 nautical miles, including five crossings of the Indian Ocean, and spent 14 months on the ship. So 90,000 miles during my whole three years of sea time that led me to become an officer at sea, I covered something like um, 300,000 miles by sea, propelled by machinery. In my later life, and in the last 25 years, I have spent time not on ships propelled by machinery, but ships dominated by sail. Uh, this is my own sketch. Not quite finished yet, there's quite a bit of work to do. But the reason I'm going to show you this, the reason I'm holding it up, is to demonstrate the limitations of a sea passage under sail. Now, this is a ship that I spent quite a lot of time on in the last 20 years. There were two ships, sister ships. One is called the Prince William, which was sold to the Pakistani Navy. And the other ship, which has now gone also from British waters, was the Stavros S. Niarchos. My longest voyage of the Stavros S. Niarchos was from the Canaries back to the UK, which was a journey of about two and a half thousand miles and was all under sail. The problem with square rigged sailing ships is that they are very difficult to maneuver. However, on a ship of this size in 2021, you would have not only sail, but you would have engine propulsion as well. So what I want you to imagine now, and this is where we are with Paul tonight, is that he joins a ship in Caesarea, which is traveling north to Sidon, which is about 60 miles along the coast in a northerly direction. And there from Sidon, because they cannot head into the wind, they have to go under the lee of Cyprus to a port in what is now called Turkey. And they were propelled entirely, not by power, obviously, not by sail and oars, galleons used oars, but merchant ships in the Mediterranean in this period were propelled entirely by the wind. And the only sail that they would have would be one or possibly two sails here, about this point, just above the deck. And that would be their entire means of propulsion. It was not an easy life at all. And I'm gonna pick up the narrative in a few minutes. And let's go back then to Acts chapter 27. So I've got some notes here. I'll refer to the notes as I go along. Okay, here we go. First one, it was decided that we should sail to Italy. Now, Italy was um, some 30 days away by sea under normal conditions. 
but as you can probably gather from this passage, these were far, far, far from normal conditions. Paul and the prisoners joined the ship with Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. He was a senior chap. And entering into a ship, they put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. So they had a voyage plan. And the voyage plan was to take them north and to pick up the coast of Asia. And then they had only one choice, and that was to sail in a westerly direction. Now, this brings us to an interesting point of navigation at sea in these early days. And it was basically navigation by coastal navigation. The ships would hug the coastline as far as they could, and the master of the ship would be able to recognize, because of his long experience, he would be able to recognize the points of interest along the coast. And so, if you like, feel his way from point to point. The problem was that as soon as they got into deep water, if they were blown off course, or in this case, if they had a sail under Cyprus, until they reached the, a near coast again, they were almost lost. The only reference points that they had would be as follows. There were very early charts being produced of the Mediterranean in around the first century AD. And there were some written voyage instructions produced in Latin and in other Mediterranean languages. But by and large, the merchant ships would simply go on the instincts of the master. And they were fairly limited once he was outside, out of sight of land. The master would be able to deduce where North was simply by identifying the pole star during the hours of darkness in a cloudless sky, or being able to discern the sun at its high, highest point during the day when the sun is always bearing due south. From that point onwards, they would then deduce where the wind was coming from and therefore the probability of a landfall that they would recognize. It was a little bit hit and miss to say the least. Nothing like the navigation we have today on our tall ships. In the, in the most um, basic tall ships today, we have satellite navigation, we have radar, we have telecommunications, we have all the modern bits and pieces that go with safety life of life at sea. Not so quite clearly in that first century AD. And if you're interested in history, can I commend to you the history of the Mediterranean region? Because it really is the cradle of civilization. And it really makes for some very interesting reading. Whether you're interested in sea travel or not, this is a fascinating place to look at and a fascinating place to visit. So here we are. We're now in up to verse three. Julius treated Paul kindly. It's always good to have friends. It's always good to have people, even if they're not totally on your side, who are at least kind towards you. And here, Paul is receiving kindness from the hands of a Roman centurion. Verse four, when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Again, this ship cannot head into the wind. It can only sail with the wind coming up from the, the, the stern or possibly from either bow, sorry, I, it, from a beam. It can't sail into the wind. So it's greatly hampered in its ability to maneuver. And verse five says, when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pavonia, we came to Myra, a city in Lycia. Now this is where things change because once they get to Lycia, the whole body of people, the prisoners are transferred to a different ship. 
It is a ship from Alexandria. Now, Alexandria, as you probably know, is in Egypt. And when we read of them throwing the cargo overboard during the tempest, it is quite clear that this ship is carrying a cargo of grain. It's also quite clear that it's quite a large ship. It's actually carrying a cargo of grain per Rome, and it's carrying by this time 276 souls on board. This is quite a large merchant ship. The sailors are possibly more sophisticated. The captain is possibly more knowledgeable than on that previous coastal vessel. But either way, they're now in, in the hands of a much larger ship crossing the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean, as some of you will know, those who have traveled in the region, it isn't the kind of blue sky, blue sea, peaceful kind of place that you think. The Mediterranean is capable of being as ferocious as any ocean, with the exception of the, the Atlantic in the middle of the winter. It can be a very unpleasant and cold place to be, not kind of Thompson's Tours area at all. The Mediterranean is a trying place to find yourself. So they join this ship, and verse seven says, when they had sailed slowly many days, and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, the wind not permitting us, we sailed under the shelter of Crete and Solomon. Passing with difficulty, we came to the Fair Havens. So now I'm gonna consult my notes again. So they're now moving across there in a westerly direction, unable to travel into the headwind. They've come across from the coast of Turkey, and I have a note here, just to say that the ge geography of the close sea, like the Mediterranean, is important. Basic way was to navigate by headland, to headland, as we've said, but they're now in the middle of an ocean, as far as this is concerned. And it is a very unpleasant voyage that's now ahead of them. So what do we have? We have them coming out of Ale uh, in the ship out of Alexandria, and I'm down to verse seven, and my headline here is this: that the dark clouds are beginning to gather. Now let's just be personal for a moment here, because there are various things that can come out of this passage that we can apply to ourselves. Dark clouds gathering. I wonder when the last time it was that you were faced with dark clouds gathering in your life. Because this is very significant. In the midst of these dark clouds, the Apostle Paul finds that he is visited by an angel of the Lord, and the angel gives him confidence and helps him to reassure the crew, the passengers, and everyone else. Let me speak personally. I'm speaking for us all when I say, I've got a few dark clouds at this very moment in my own life. And those dark clouds for me, as a lifetime seafarer, and bear in mind that I was at sea until the age of 69, and I'd been appointed by some very decent companies along the way, I'm wearing a Trinity House top, because in my middle life, when I took my degree, Trinity House came to my rescue, and they appointed me as one of their officers on a cable laying project. And the dark days that I experienced in my middle life, when I began my degree, were lightened no end by the intervention of another human being, Captain Dove, Trinity House, appointed me to his company. 
And my dark days were lightened by this fact that my degree with my family dependent on me and my mortgage dependent on me was lightened no end by the, the fact that the Trinity House officer who appointed me enabled me to complete my degree without any debt whatsoever. And I look back on that with great joy and great humility, really. And I want to speak to those of you who at this moment are going through any periods of darkness in your own life where your health is concerned. I often joke with my wife, you know, that um, I've never been able to discover any benefits in growing old. About five years ago, I went for some nerve conduction tests to Worcester Royal Hospital. And I saw a doctor there, Dr. Blake. And when she had diagnosed a condition that I have called peripheral neuropathy, she said to me, number one, Peter, don't climb ladders. Well, I was just about to go off on another sales training voyage. So that was, uh, that was water, that, that wasn't what I wanted to hear. And number two, when I said, I thought you were going to tell me that I had some incurable disease, she said, you have. It's called old age. There is no cure for this. There is no cure. You'll just have to put up with the pain. And I promise you, my friends, that the pain has caused me some very dark days right up until this present moment. In fact, if I can just share a bit of humor with you, since Easter, I haven't been able to walk in the mornings until I've stretched my limbs for seriously using, using um, Pilates exercises for about 20 minutes or half an hour. And I'm okay then for the rest of the day. But the next night, it's all, all over starting again. So it's very unpleasant. They are dark days, but I want to remind you, as we read this account of Paul, that the Lord is always with us. He is there on the darkest night, and we are never forsaken. So let's just read what we have here. So now they're facing um, a difficult situation, and Paul says, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our own lives. The centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman than the owner of the ship and took no notice of Paul, and so it goes on. Then it says, verse 13, that the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close to Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon. This tempestuous headwind is going to cause them great difficulty. Dark clouds gathering indeed. But Paul is able to say that an angel has appeared and we're going to be all right. We won't lose any lives. Let's just talk about this soft southerly wind you know sometimes the soft southerly wind blows in our lives and we think that everything is going wonderfully and we venture out and suddenly everything changes well you know there are two possible reasons why they experience this significant change in their fortunes as far as the wind was concerned one was and i've experienced this myself in the canaries on a sail training ship that you can be sailing along in very pleasant conditions in the Canaries, and suddenly you come past a headland, and immediately you're into 50 mile an hour winds. It's almost as if something untoward has taken over. And the truth is that the wind funnels through islands and it accelerates 
as it funnels through. The other explanation for this change in wind direction here, sudden change in wind direction, is an intense period of a meteorological low pressure system moving rapidly across the Mediterranean in this particular day of Paul's experience. And suddenly a southerly wind is turned into a northerly wind simply on account of a meteorological cause. And it could be either of the two, but either way, it was very unpleasant. And we say we see here in verse 16 that running under the shelter of the island called Claudia, they secured the skiff with difficulty. The skiff being a kind of boat that they towed a sto uh, astern and they brought it on board. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. Now, this again is a very interesting issue here. Just a practical issue here for those of you who are interested in shipbuilding or manufacture of cars or whatever it is. The, the shipbuilding techniques in the Roman dominated Mediterranean were in fact very advanced in the Mediterranean world. They tended to be double, double skinned hulls, and each strake or plank was joined by mortise and tenon joint into the next plank above it. And that very slow process of building a hull made for great hull strength. So it was quite advanced technology. But here, the seamen on board also reckoned that they needed to undergird the ship, that is, pass ropes or cables underneath the ship, bringing it, it on the above on the other side, and somehow acting as a band to hold the hull together. This was a nasty situation in which they found themselves. But I'm going to move on here, and I just want to close with some very significant points because I am mindful of the time. So let's just go down to my last points here. I've looked at the personal insight into the storms that they have and compared them with the storms of life, which we all face from time to time. They could be the storms that I've referred to here tonight, the storm of growing old. They could be the storm of some medical issue in your own life. They could be the, st the storm, the dark storm, the dark cloud of some medical issue of an, a loved one within your family. And there are, are always very lonely times in my experience when we really feel that we have nowhere to turn. I want to reassure each of us that our God is the God of the darkest night and our God is the God of the brightest morning yet to come. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So I want to just hammer home this in your darkest moment, dear friend, the Lord is there. In Paul's darkest moment, the Lord was there, never ever forsaken. And the last thing that I want to hammer home here tonight is the actual issue of the shipwreck. I've got here a chart, an admiralty chart. This is a redundant chart now. It's of the islands of the west coast of Scotland. And we have on this Admiralty chart, you can see it's in glorious technicolor these days. When I first went to see, it was in all in glorious black and white. But now we have multicolors. And what we've got here is a very similar situation that was faced by Paul as the ship approached Malta. 
you will remember that we read that the sailors discerned that they were closing with the land and they took a sounding and it was so many fathoms. Then they took another sounding and the fathoms were less and less and less. And then they saw a possible landing place. They had anchors out, they cut the anchors adrift, they set the mainsail and they headed straight for the beach. They were determined to put their ship aground on a safe beach at some point. Before they got there, she actually got stuck on a reef. The bow was secured first, firm and fast on the reef, and the vessel was, in fact, something like this. We have a bay here. The vessel was stuck here, out in the bay, on a reef in very shallow water. And the centurion said, OK, no one is going to lose their lives. We're going to go with Paul here. No one is going to be killed. No one is going to try to escape. Those who can swim, swim for the shore. And those who can't swim, hold on to whatever you can find. Something secure in the darkness. And you know something? There is a gospel message here for those of you who preach the gospel, for those of you who deliver gospel messages. On the darkest night, in the wildest storm, in the utter chaos of sin and darkness, in Christ, the Savior, the Savior of Calvary, you always have a secure holding place. And everyone reached the shore, just as Paul had been advised by the angel, not a soul was lost from this shipwreck. Now, it's one thing to have a shipwreck in this modern era. I saw one of our tall ships come to grief about five years ago, just off the Irish coast. And I also saw footage of the rescue. The young crew, they were Swedish children. They all took to their life rafts. The Irish lifeboat service was on hand. Every one was saved. But that is in the modern era. And here off Malta, we have an ancient shipwreck. No technology whatsoever. And by the grace of God, everyone was saved. The dark night became the bright morning as they set foot on Malta. Here in chapter 27, there is much for us to learn, much to encourage our hearts, much to see us through the darkest night of our own sorrows, if we have those sorrows. May God bless you and thank you for listening. Amen.